Was the BYU football program a loser when it came to the transfer portal this past transfer portal period? Well, the Athletics sure think so. Let's talk about that. Let's also get to your guys' questions on a Mailbag Thursday. You are Locked On Cougars, your daily podcast on the BYU Cougars. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is up, everybody? I'm Jake Hatch, your host here on Locked On Cougars, resident BYU insider. Thank you for making Locked On Cougars your first listen of the day. Always appreciate you guys checking out the show whenever you happen to download and or watch and or listen or however you consume the podcast. Thank you so much for your support. Today's title sponsors are new friends over at FanDuel. FanDuel Sportsbook is the official sportsbook of Locked On. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. All right, let's dive right in and talk BYU football. But a quick reminder for you guys, if you have not done so already, make sure you subscribe to the show, whether that's hitting the follow button on YouTube, uh, push subscribe slash follow wherever you get your podcast on your podcast provider of choice. And make sure if, uh, on YouTube as well, you hit that uh, bell no, that bell icon, enables notifications to let you know when episodes drop and you can catch them as soon as they come available. All right. So uh, there was an interesting article written uh, by The Athletic earlier this week, and it involved two writers, uh, Justin Williams and Sam Kahn Jr., who are both guys that are based in the Big 12 area. I believe Justin is uh, the beat writer, if I'm not mistaken, for Cincinnati, also doing some other work. Sam Kahn covers essentially the Big 12 for The Athletic. And they wrote an article, and this happened to all the other Power 5 conferences, called the Big 12 Transfer Portal 2023. Winner losers and toss up teams they went uh team by team here and laid out okay who did these teams add who did they lose and byu was in this group uh talking about uh their group and they said that the notable additions include all the ones we already know about keaton slovis aiden robbins paul miley ian fitzgerald isaiah banya from boise state jackson cravens eddie heckard from weaver state Notable departures, Gabe Judy Lowley, Clark Barrington, Keenan Peely, Logan Fano, Dallin Holker, Campbell Barrington, and Tate Romney. This is what they had to say about this. The Cougars saw a ton of talent and production depart up and down the depth chart. Gone are both Barrington brothers and Holker on offense. The defense lost starting cornerback Judy Lally and linebacker Peely to Tennessee, Romney to Arizona State, and Fano to rival Utah. Splash additions, Slovis and Robbins, should provide a notable offensive boost. BYU also replenished the trenches with Miley and Fitzgerald up front and Banya and Cravens on the defensive side of the ball from Boise State, but all of them have large vacancies to, fills, uh, to fill. Excuse me. If it wasn't a completely lopsided portal, excuse me, it might go back over that. It wasn't a completely lopsided portal experience, but the losses stand out. Verdict, loser. Now, all due respect to Justin Williams and Sam Kahn, but I don't know if they could be more wrong about this because uh, the guys BYU lost. Okay, Gabe Judy Lally is a starter. Keenan Peely is a starter. Clark Barrington was a starter for BYU, but nobody, and I mean nobody inside the BYU football program expected him to be back at BYU in 2023. Most thought, yours truly included, that he was headed to the NFL. Well, he just he wanted to play one more year, and he transferred to Baylor to play with his younger brother. Campbell was a part-time starter. Dallin Holker, part-time starter. Tate Romney, very much a reserve. Logan Fano hadn't even seen the field as a BYU Cougar because of an ACL tear. You're telling me that the guys that BYU lost are not offset by what they're bringing in. Obviously, you're also probably including the conversation about guys going to the NFL. But let's look at the list of guys who are coming in and what is notable about them. Keaton Slovis, a multi-year starter at quarterback at the Power 5 level. Okay, well, you lose Jaron Hall, it's a loss, but you're bringing in a proven Power 5 starting quarterback, and that, I think, is a win. Aiden Robbins, a 1,000-yard running back coming in from UNLV. You expect that production will translate to BYU. Paul Miley, a 12-game starter this past year on a Rose Bowl team at Utah, and you're telling me that he can't make up, at least in part, for the loss of Campbell Barrington and or Clark Barrington. Ian Fitzgerald, who is a 29-game starter at the FCS level, is a guy who's coming in looking to prove himself at the highest level, and they even forgot Waylon Lapua, who was a, what, 13-game starter for Utah State this past year. Uh, okay, the offensive line, I think, is a wash. Now, Isaiah Banya and Jackson Cravens add to a, a defensive line that needs improvement. Okay, I think that's actually an upgrade with both of them on that BYU defensive line. And then Eddie Heckard, they actually, funny enough, the original article completely left Eddie Heckard 
off of this list. Eddie Heckard is an FCS All-American, a three-time All-Big Sky honoree at cornerback. You can't tell me that BYU is a loser in this. At the very worst, I would have put BYU in the toss-up category, saying, okay, we're going to see where things shake out. I believe that you actually upgraded your talent base for BYU via the transfer portal versus losing or having an exodus of talent exit the program. I, I just, I don't understand the thought process from the athletic here. And that's nothing against them. They have, they're entitled to their opinion, but I look at this and think that BYU plugged major holes in their lineup with guys that they brought in via the transfer portal. Are there still holes to plug? Absolutely. I'd love to see BYU add at least one or two more defensive backs, whether those are safeties and or cornerbacks. I think more importantly, cornerbacks from the transfer portal, very important for BYU. One position group that I think needs a, a, just an influx, maybe one or two guys, if they can find the right guys, is the wide receiving core. They have a nice top three of Keanu Hill, Chase Roberts, and Cody Epps, who are probably going to be your top three receivers in 2023 and have Keaton Slovis slinging the pill to them. But... I think if they can find a guy out there, Freddie Roberson was one of those guys that they thought might uh, be might be the answer coming in from Eastern Washington. He ultimately opted, if I'm not mistaken, from Mississippi State, so you didn't get his signature. But you can continue to comb through the portal and see if you can find a name or two at the wide receiver position to, I, that I think would be very, very welcome to upgrade that talent base. So, I, like I said, this is a weird thing to me to say that BYU is a, is a loser in the transfer portal when I look at it and they added one, two, three, four, five, six, seven starters. I think all seven of the guys they list on this list, including if you also want to add Waylon Lapua, who's, who's a potential starter at offensive line, those are eight starting caliber guys BYU added to their roster versus one, two, three, four five, maybe four and a half guys on their list of guys they lost that were starters or starting caliber players. Okay, if that's it, so eight, five, you're plus three in the margin? I, I think it's actually a net win. I think BYU upgraded their talent base. I was very, very impressed with how BYU handled the transfer portal this past winter. But uh, we'll continue to track this, obviously, throughout the upcoming spring ball. Uh, Jay Hill uh, indicated that BYU will be active in that spring portal period as well. They've held a couple of scholarships open with the idea of adding a name or two in that group. And we'll talk more about that as it draws closer. But it's now time for you guys to have your say on the show. Your guys' questions is Mailbag Thursday edition of the show. We'll get to as many of them as we can possibly handle on today's show before we round it out here in just a moment. First, a word on our friends over at FanDuel. And of course, they are a brand new sponsor here on the Locked On Podcast Network. We could not be more excited to have them on board. The best part is the NFL playoffs are here, my friends, and we're really excited about our new sports betting partner for Locked On because they're the number one sports book in America, our friends at FanDuel. And if you're new to FanDuel, that's even better. They have so many great features that make betting on sports fun and easy. New customers, you can join today and get started with a $150 in free bets guaranteed when you place your first five dollar bet you bet bucks 150 bucks to you guys win or lose just sign up at fanduel.com slash locked on you heard that right fanduel.com slash locked on fanduel has all your favorite bets from money line to point spreads to player props plus you can even combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with the same game parlay which increases the winnings you can rake in that's the best part about this so you guys need to go give it a shot if you want to bet on the afc or nfc championship games this weekend you got a good feeling about the chiefs the 49ers Obviously, I'm rooting on my Niners. Got my hat on. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube. But if you have a good feeling on that, get started with FanDuel today and cash in right now. The best part is it's all on one app that's safe, secure, and super easy to use. So football fans, do not miss out. Place your first $5 bet to get $150 in free bets, win or lose, at FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make every moment mean more with FanDuel, the official sportsbook partner of the NFL, and of course, a brand new sponsor right here on the Locked On Podcast Network. Thank you once again for joining us right here on Locked On Cougars and making us your first listen every day. Make sure you check out our brand new podcast, Locked On College Basketball. It's everything you need to know about college basketball in one place, plus hear from big name experts, insiders, coaches, and players. That's Locked On College Basketball, available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. All right, time for you guys to have your say on the show as we do each Thursday. It's a mailbag edition of the show. Uh, we had a related question that came in from a number of you. Trevor at BYU Cougar Corner asked this question. Uh, Keith Wilson, uh, no, Keith actually asked a separate question. I apologize. Keith, you're not in that group. Other guys, uh, Wild Turkey Fart Blender, 
VWAG23. Uh, also, uh, a couple other ones here. Let's see, Nick Chadwick as well. All asked a similar question on recruiting in the lead up to National Signing Day, asking about how, okay, what guys could be what you still be targeting? And also, can you give us a feel for what guys like Walker Lyons and or LJ Martin are going to do? Now, with regards to Walker Lyons, and a number of you are interested in this because you probably saw the picture of him meeting with Georgia. He's got Utah in his top three, but BYU has seemingly fall, fallen by the wayside. The way I understand it is that Walker Lyons is simply interested in going to a different program other than BYU. He's got all the bloodlines for BYU. Family, uh, uncles, aunts, parents, uh, siblings, uh, all of them. BYU folks have gone to BYU, are at BYU. He's got all the ties to Provo that you could just absolutely think would be a home run for him to be interested in BYU. But for whatever reason, he's decided he's got his sights set on a bigger program like a Georgia and Utah, very much a player for him to sign there. He is going on his mission at the end of this month, funny enough. I think it's coming up here in a couple of days, literally. He's headed to Norway. Uh, does he sign before he gets into the MTC proper and heads over to Norway? I don't know. It, actually, if I'm if I'm Walker Lyons, I might opt not to sign and hold off for two years while you're out there in the mission field and then sign when you return because you're, you're still going to be that big fish that people still want to land. When Kirby Smart is making the trip to Folsom, California to see you, you know that uh, the defending national two-time two defending national champions are in absolute love with this kid. So he's got a lot of talent. He's got a lot of hype about him. And two years from now, we're going to see where he ultimately suits up. I, like, do I think that BYU re-enters the picture? I can never say never, but it sure feels like he's got his sights playing uh, for a different program other than BYU. Now, other questions that came in here. Uh, so like Nick Chowick, I'll just add this. Why do you think there's a little attention paid to Lions as the recruiting process wraps up? BYU's tried to make pushes, folks. I can tell you this much. BYU absolutely has made pushes for Walker Lions. He's just, for whatever reason, he's just kind of rebuffed BYU and has decided he wants to look elsewhere. Now, uh, other questions coming in here. Wild for Turkey Fart Blunt. Crystal Ball on LJ Martin ending up in Provo. I am hoping and praying and whatever else I need to do that LJ Martin picks BYU. Uh, I think he would be a home run for BYU to kind of tandem with Aiden Robbins, let him grow up in the program, uh, maybe redshirt his first year, get some time playing in those four games you're afforded as a redshirt, uh, get some of that action, and then hopefully he could take over as one of those next program guys at running back for BYU in the relatively near future. We'll find out if he ultimately picks BYU, what that entails, but I think he is a fantastic, fantastic running back and be a home run run to get him into the BYU football program. Number other you have mentioned, okay, what other guys should I be paying attention to in the lead up to signing day? I mentioned earlier this week, there are three guys that I've got on my list that I'm tracking uh, that I'll be looking for. One of them is LJ Martin. I think LJ Martin's absolutely guy, probably the top guy remaining on BYU's quote unquote dream or uh, big board in terms of guys into the program. Uh, Moteki Ai Munga or Mote Munga is from def a defensive lineman from Timview. I would encourage you to keep an eye on him. Also, DeAndre Barnes out of Regis Jesuit High School out there in Colorado. Private high school, uh, but he is a guy that's got all the skill set it feels like to thrive in what BYU's defense is going to ask of him. I think those are the three that are the scholarship guys to keep an eye on. I'm also going to defer over uh, to Coogs Daily, uh, of course, Casey Lundquist doing a good job over there. He mentioned uh, actually 11 guys that BYU could be tracking in the lead-up to signing day. Now, outside of those three I just mentioned, I think most of these guys at the ver at the most are preferred walk-ons. He mentioned Kevin Doe, a guy who has made the transition from basketball to football at East High School up in Salt Lake City. Uh, he's got all the size-speed combo to make you think, okay, this is an intriguing guy. He averaged over 15 points per game on the hardwood as a junior. He was the 5A state champion in both the 100-meter dash and the 200-meter dash last season, running times of 10.91 in the 100 meters and 21.7 for in the 200 meters, I, I think he'd be an absolute uh, guy that you you bet on. Uh, that's the he's got six foot four athleticism, playing hoops. He seems like a guy that you bring in and try and bring along and develop him. Now, Prince Zombo is also a guy that recently uh, visited BYU. He's out of Arizona. He is a guy that uh, had 834 yards and 10 touchdowns this past year for his high school. He was named to the Arizona 6A first team All State. Uh, so he's got an opportunity to come in potentially as a, as a preferred walk on and bolster BYU's wide receiver room. Let me also add a word of caution on on some of these walk-on guys. 
Walk-ons are walk-ons for a reason. They're low risk, potential high reward, but you're not bringing them in, putting them on scholarship uh, because if that happens, it obviously costs you with a scholarship slot. Preferred walk-ons are paying their way. So if they come in and they flame out, there's no skin off your back. Uh, speaking of BYU, other guys to keep an eye on. Drew Coward is a preferred walk-on offer as a quarterback. His dad, Jeff Coward, played for BYU in the early 2000s. Uh, he played uh, for Ty Demmer and Max Hall at American Leadership Academy in Arizona. Uh, he comes in if he wants to be a BYU legacy guy. You take him. Other guys, there's a small offensive lineman the BYU is engaged. One from Provo High School in Strance Mangisi. Uh, he's a guy that's just a absolute looks like an absolute freak in terms of his pictures. You look at him you're like, wow, that's a big dude. Could he be a guy? Gage Tanner, a linebacker from Meridian, Idaho. Uh, Stone Mulatalo, David Latu, and John Tam Tamopeau, who are all defensive linemen from Snow College. All these are walk-on offers. If any of them decide they want to pick BYU and come to come to play for the Cougars, you will not see those names I just mentioned outside of the top three uh, on signing day unless BYU has a change of heart late and gives them a scholarship offer. They are going to be walk-ons. Walk-ons do not get announced on National Signing Day, but those are some of the names to pay attention to if you're a guy who's interested in seeing what BYU does on signing day. Now, other questions here. Texas conservative T Carpenter 37 says, rumor has it there is another University of Utah transfer coming. Any idea who might who that might be? I have asked around a T Carpenter and I have no clue who it might be. And the thing about it is BYU's already started school. So unless they're already enrolled, uh, they're not going to be part of BYU's football program for spring ball. They'd have to come in during the spring term. That's going to be four, three, four months from now. So I don't know who that might be. It also says, is the linebacker room looking better for spring and fall? It says, I'm always listening down here in Texas. Thank you for making my commute informative and enjoyable. Well, hey, thank you for tuning in, uh, T. Carpenter, Texas conservative. Thank you for your support. Now, with regards to the linebacker room, I'm cautiously optimistic on BYU's linebackers. I think Ben Bywater, Max Tooley are your lead guys going into this season. Uh, Tooley is just a, a, an absolute uh, highlight reel waiting to happen with his pick sixes and his ability to kind of freelance and make big plays. Ben Bywater is a tackling machine. Does he find himself out of position often? Yeah, but he also makes plenty of plays in his own right, as evidenced by that pick six to help BYU win their bowl game. So I think the linebacking core at the very top of it is actually very solid. The question I've got about linebacking core is going to be is the depth there. Are, are the Wilson brothers, uh, Josh and Micah, capable of stepping up? Are you going to have other linebackers who are able to make the move up the depth chart and prove themselves as capable guys? One guy to pay attention to in the linebacking core, Bodie Schoonover. He looks like an absolute unit, and he looked like a unit coming home off of a mission. What can he do after a year's worth of work in the weight room? Only time will tell, but I am highly, highly looking forward to seeing that young man suit up for BYU. Now, other questions uh, real quick here. Uh, Keith Wilson said, look into your crystal ball. What do you see the win-loss records for football and basketball in the first year in the Big 12? I've said for football, my baseline is a 6-6 six and six record. You get the bowl eligibility in year one in the Big 12, that's a home run for me. Anything beyond that is gravy on top, the cherry on top, and you celebrate that wildly. 6-6 six and six is what I'm looking at for BYU in the first year of the Big 12. Now, basketball, losing record. I, I'm not saying that they're one game under 500, they're 2-27. I don't know, but the way that the Big 12 sets up in basketball right now and with where BYU is at hoops-wise right now, if BYU gets to 500 next year, whether they uh, capitalize on a soft non-conference schedule and pump themselves up going into Big 12 play and they get absolutely obliterated in the Big 12, uh, it's going to be fun all the same just to have the affiliation BYU will have in the Big 12. Playing at Fog Allen Fieldhouse against Texas, being able to go, uh, not that Texas, at Kansas, my apologies. Wow, that was brutal. That was a big gaffe on my part. But uh, opportunities to play against programs like West Virginia, Cincinnati, just Houston, the number one team in the country for a lot of this season. Opportunities to play against the best of the best. The only way you get better is to prove yourself against the best of the best. And that is going to be the opportunity afforded to BYU. It's going to, is it going to give BYU a gaudy record next year. Absolutely not. The basketball program, Mark Pope, has more work cut out for him than almost any other program in the Big 12 for BYU going into that conference. A number of other BYU's other sports are going to be very competitive. I think football is actually going to be decently competitive from the get-go. Basketball, whew, I, I'm 
terrified just in terms of BYU's win loss record next year. Now, uh, one other question here says Daniel Rigby, why did BYU men's basketball digress in the WCC? Has it been seemingly a downward trajectory with perpetual mediocrity during our time in the conference? Well, BYU was a top three team for a lot of that time in, in the WCC. They were never never able to get over the top against uh, Gonzaga. That, that's very, very legitimate. There's facts are there, Daniel. But the last couple of seasons for BYU, yeah, they have had a little bit of a downward trend. And is it because of the constant turnover on the roster? I think that's part of it. I think Mark Pope is trying to kind of meld a, a young core with guys like Dallin Hall, uh, uh, who I think of Richie Saunders, Tanner Toulson. He's trying to get those young guys up to speed. And the only way to get them up to speed is essentially to play them and let them kind of figure things out this year. This year doesn't, in the long run, term scheme of the BYU basketball program this year means very little, at least to me personally, it's more about getting ready for the big 12. Can you find guys? Can Fus Traore continue to make uh, improvements? Can Atiki Ali Atiki continue to develop himself? You need a lot of these young guys to play through a lot of the struggles they're dealing with right now. Turnover, shooting woes, uh, just not playing as a unit. Sometimes you have to go through the valleys to get to the peaks and BYU is in a deep Valley, right? Right now, the, the, the last weekend, absolutely brutal to watch that that performance in both the USF and Santa Clara games for BYU. They have to get better. But the only way, the only way to do it is to go through it. You've got to experience it. All right. Uh, one final question here. And I apologize if I didn't get to all of the questions on today's show. There's a couple I'm, I might not get to, uh, and I will get to them uh, on tomorrow's show if I, if a couple of our stragglers coming in. But the last one here, last word belongs to our friend Nick Lee over there in the uh, Pacific Northwest, a uh, host of Locked on Seahawks, if you're a Seattle Seahawks fan. says, I am a uniform junkie, but BYU, has BYU gotten too sophisticated? Should they just stick with the class? White helmet, stretch white logo, or with one or two alternates a year. It seems like you could balance the fun uniform sets with tradition better. Now, Nick, that's a very interesting question because the aesthetic for BYU, when they wear that royal blue with the white, it is a clean, clean look. And I would encourage BYU to wear that uh, uniform ensemble royal with white, uh, with those with the white helmets with the royal blue uh, markings, the white. That's the stuff that BYU should make their bread and butter. The the Royal should be BYU's bread and butter in the in the uniform game. Can you mix in Navy every so often? Sure. Can you mix in an alternate uniform, blackouts, et cetera, every so often? Sure, you can also do that. But your base should always be what you traditionally have been, the Royal Blue and White combo. BYU is synonymous with that Royal Blue. For any fan nationwide, they'll tell you that if they if you ask them what color BYU is, oh yeah, it's that Royal Blue. That that's the color that BYU is most synonymous with. Embrace it. Make it your base. But yeah, feel free to mix in maybe an alternate uniform here and there. But like, like you talk about Nick, you don't need to be changing it up every game. You don't need to be a program that every single game is a brand new uniform combo when we're trying to be the 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 organ that BYU is actually not. The, some of the best programs, Notre Dame, Alabama, uh, USC, they wear the same thing. They've worn the same thing for decades. And guess what? It's an iconic look. BYU has an iconic look. Have they moved away from it at points? Yes, they did. But they are back with it. The Royal Blue is back in the, the, the ether for BYU. Absolutely embrace it and make it your base for BYU football. All right. Uh, hopefully I got to as many questions as I possibly could. Oh, one more. Uh, Cal VJ at CJ Real Hoops. Jaron Hall to the Raiders. That's not a question. That's me speaking it into existence. You want him in Las, in Las Vegas? I can see that. Uh, that'd be interesting, Calvi. We'll find out. It'll be interesting to see where Jaron ultimately does land, but hopefully you speaking it into, into existence makes it actually happen. All right, so there you go. I answer you guys' questions. We'll come back. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about what's going on with BYU uh, basketball tonight for the women's team. Uh, the men's basketball team is on a bye today. Also need to look back at one of the more wild games in BYU. BYU and Boise State's independent series. Uh, it featured, let's just put it this way, a pick six, a failed two-point conversion, and a whole lot more. We'll get to all of that in just a moment. Thank you once again for making Locked On Cougars your first listen of the day. Always appreciate you guys enjoying the show and reaching out. Uh, by the way, we have some great sponsors that are inbound that have been signing on with us. We still have 
spaces for you and your company to be a part of Locked On Cougars. If you want to be a part of that, please send us an email. LockedOnBYU at gmail.com is the email address. We'd love to get you guys in touch with our sales team and get you on the pathway to advertising success. All right, uh, two things before we go on today's show quickly. The BYU women's basketball team is in Moraga, California, taking on the St. Mary's Gales tonight. 7.30 p.m. Mountain Time tip, 6.30 out there in the Bay Area. If you happen to be going out to watch it, it'll be University Credit Union Pavilion. They're on the campus of St. Mary's College. It'll also be streamed live on the WCC network. If you want to see Lauren Gustin and the women's team go after it, hopefully Gustin can out rebound St. Mary's as a squad. Once again, we'll find out tonight in that matchup. All right. And before we go, BYU's, we continue to look back at all 155 of BYU's independent era games. Well, BYU played a pretty memorable game that ended with a seven to six scoreline. Many of you will recall this in 2012, BYU went to Boise State. Now, we've talked about Riley Nelson and the back injury he suffered since Weber State. Well, he continued to kind of grind his way through it. You could tell he was not 100%. He had maybe his worst performance statistically in this game against Boise State. BYU went up to Boise. Uh, the Broncos were 24th in the country, obviously a highly uh, thought of program. This was shortly after the Kellen Moore era ended. It's funny to think that now he is the offensive coordinator for the Dallas Cowboys. We'll see for how much longer, but nonetheless, he does have that title right now. But the thing about this, Riley Nelson uh, came in this, uh, uh, came into this game and just was brutal. And I, I've got no other way to say it. He ended up uh, completing four of nine passes for a grand total of 19 yards, zero touchdowns, and three interceptions. One of those interceptions went to a defensive tackle by the name of Mike Atkinson, who rumbled 36 yards for a touchdown, which put Boise State up seven nothing. Well, BYU realized that hey. Riley ain't got it tonight. So they insert Taysom Hill, the Idaho native, into the lineup, and Taysom comes in, ends up uh, going 4 of 10 for 42 yards, zero touchdowns, zero interceptions. Also ran for 12, uh, tw had 12 carries for 72 yards to lead BYU's rushing effort. He also scored a touchdown after uh, putting together, BYU put together a crazy, crazy drive late in this game in the fourth quarter. A 90, let's see, it was 94 yards. I, I, man, I accidentally closed the gap. I do this all the time. I apologize, guys. Uh, but it's the joys of life. 11 plays, 95 yards. Uh, 426 off the clock. They scored three minutes and 37 seconds to go. And Bronco Mendenhall decided to go for two in this game. And Taysom dropped back to Bass, uh, got immediate pressure, gets out of the pocket, tries to complete a pass on the run. It gets deflected, goes incomplete. And BYU does not get the ball back. And they lose 7-6. to six. Now, obviously a disappointing loss, especially the nature of that loss. They easily could have kicked the PAT, played for overtime, and uh, kind of cast their lot there. Bronco Mendenhall said after this game, I would do it again. I would go for two again in this one. Now, the one thing, the the, the craziest thing in this game, it's not the Mike Atkinson uh, picks. It's not Taysom Hill uh, showing, I guess, glimpses of what he might become for BYU down the road. It is that BYU, they had four turnovers in this game, if I, if I recall correctly. The three interceptions uh, by Riley Nelson as well as, uh, I think it was, yeah, it was a fumble at the one yard line. And BYU's defense, in a preview of how good this defense truly was. And by the way, if you go back through the 2012 season, BYU in many ways wasted a generational type defense. This is the type of defense that can win you championships. I, I, I don't say that facetiously. BYU's defense was so good in 2012. The offense is what failed them. And ultimately, we all know what happened after the season offensively, if you know a little bit about your history. But in this game, BYU fumbled the ball on the one yard line and BYU BYU's defense said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to put together one of the more epic goal line stands that has ever been put together in college football history. Four plays from the one yard line and Boise State could not punch it in. Chris Peterson looked absolutely demoralized. Bronco Mendenhall, for his part, after that fourth down stop, he was running on the field, fist pumping, just absolutely jacked out of his mind. That Goal line stand should not be lost in the BYU highlight reel. It should be part of BYU's highlight reel every year. I know it came in a loss. I, you lost the game seven to six. So it sucks that you lost the, lost the game. You dropped a two and two on the season. This was a BYU team that after beating a Weber State was ranked 25th in the country. Like they were nationally ranked and two weeks later they're at 500. But that goal line stand, that was 
absolutely epic. It was one of those goal line stands that you, if you, if you watch this game, I was not in Boise. I was watching it on TV. And I remember watching that and saying, there's no way they're going to stop these guys. Boise State's going to punch this in. And they're going to put this game to bed because BYU's offense, frankly, was inept. They had a grand total of just under, let's see, it was 139 rushing yards here. Uh, 139 rushing yards and 61 passing yards. That comes out to a grand total of 200 total yards on offense. Now, Boise State wasn't much better. They had around 250 total yards. But still, brutal. Brutal offensive performance for BYU. But that goal line stand, four straight plays with your backs literally against the wall, one yard, three feet, 36 inches, and you don't give an inch. Okay, you give it maybe an inch or two, but you did not let that t- uh, Boise State team get into the end zone. That goal line stand, like I said, it, it should not be lost to history because that is just one of the more epic uh, series of football that I have ever seen with my own eyes. And I Refused to let it die because it was just it was epic. Because guys like Ziggy Ansa, Kyle Van Noy, uh, Wona Kavanga, Spencer Hadley were playing on this team. Ethan Monomaluna, Romney Funga. Uh, 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 who else am I thinking of? Um, uh, whew, geez, uh, Joe Sampson's on this team. Jordan Johnson was the, was a cornerback on this squad. Daniel Sorensen, Dirty Dan was one of BYU's better players. This was a defense. Speaking of the 2012 defense, that as the season progressed. It got progressively better and better and better. And it actually started the season extremely well. We talked about Washington State just a few days ago and BYU's 30-6 to win. I actually was reading up on something about that, funny enough, as I was posting some stuff on Instagram. In the 10-year history of uh, Mike Leach's head coaching career to that point, you know how many times his team had been held without a touchdown? Three times in 10 years of coaching uh, college football. That's impressive stuff, and BYU was one of those three teams. This BYU defense in 2012, in many ways, gets overlooked and just uh, kind of underappreciated because of BYU's overall lackluster record on the season as a whole, but it should not be forgotten what this defense did for BYU. It kept them in games like this one at Boise State that they had no business being in. And by the way, Boise State, not a great team. Like I said, this is the post-Kellen Moore era. They were not uh, the program that they were with Kellen Moore at the at the helm. Joe Southwick was their quarterback. He was 15 of 25 in this game for 145 yards. No touchdowns, no interceptions. DJ Har- Harper ran for 112 yards. But there was nothing special about this Boise State team that like, similar to what they had been in the previous four years with Kellen Moore running their offense. But BYU's defense went in there and kept BYU alive when BYU's offense was awful. Awful, 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 awful. Like, I'm going to post, I post these highlights. I put together these little highlight reels of BYU and Boise State. Uh, the highlight reel for this one with this Boise State game might be all BYU defense. Honestly, it's, it's what it might be. There might be a couple offensive plays I find here and there. Maybe Taysom Hill scoring that touchdown, but that goal line stand, it should not be forgotten. And I, I refuse to let it die. I, I just, it's one of those series that when I started thinking about different games in this 155 game series I'm doing here on the podcast, I immediately went to that one. I'm like, there's that Boise State goal line stand in 2012. We're going to talk about that. And like I said, I, I refuse to let that one go. And I think it, it, it was indicative of truly how generationally good that BYU defense was in 2012. All right. I'll step off the soapbox now. and We'll round out today's show with uh, thanking you guys. You guys are absolutely phenomenal. I love all of you out there. And that sincerely, like the, the love uh, that I have for you guys out there in Cougar Nation, whether you guys agree or disagree with my takes, I cannot uh, believe how much engagement you guys give me and let me know uh, about the show, what you like about it. So thank you for your guys' support. Thank you for making us your first listen of the day. would encourage you guys to go out the door here to make sure you make your second listen. Our friends over at the Locked On Big 12 podcast, great way to get caught up on BYU's new conference home in 30 minutes or less. Get it free and available wherever you get your podcast or check it out on YouTube. All right, that's going to do it. Have a great rest of your day once again, my friends. Hope you all are doing fantastic out there in Cougar Nation. This has been the Locked On Cougars podcast. See ya.